Um, we came up with this topic to discuss long before the last few weeks of raging internet debate about social trust, uh, truth, free speech, et cetera. But these are obviously topics that are pretty core to the narrative around crypto broadly. Um, talk to me a little bit about your reaction to the last few weeks and where you think we are in the popular perception around uh, the future of social trust, truth, and most importantly, crypto's role to play. Wow, that's a big one. Boom, Boom. third it up. <laughs> Let's wake everyone up. Um, thanks for the chance to speak with you on stage. I appreciate this. I think you've been a tremendous investor and a good friend of Space Mesh from the very early days. And I will never be able to truly repay you for that. So I'm just thanking you on stage for what it's worth. And uh, um, I think there's a lot of things that uh, the younger generation sees right and we olders see wrong. And the reason for that is mostly that they've been hitting the water when us frogs in it gradually. So the water are extremely hot now, but we can't notice it because we've been there the whole time. And then comes a kid from outside and it's like, ooh, this water are hot, man. I'm, I'm not swimming in there. So basically this okay boomer sentiment is about that, is about Okay, you baby boomers, we've seen what you can do. Like, how consensus at the bottom of the trust, uh, you know, spectrum leads to essentially inequality, leads to oppression, leads to a lot of bad things. And please give it back to us and we will show you how it's done. But, unfortunately, the sort of ideas that they come up with are socialist or communist ideas. And the problem with those ideas is that we try them and they just don't work. They sound good on, on paper, they, but, but the thing is we got to constantly keep learning. Mm -hmm. And the thing about a system which is closed is that it's got no uh, bottom-up feeding. And this bottom-up feeding is so crucial because you think you know everything there is to know and you build the rules that are uh, to guide humanity through eternity, but then, you know, things change all the time. And if, if you hang on to an old definition of what is fair, what is dangerous, so if you hold on to some definition of it rather than the actual value, you will find yourself at some point oppressing with this definition and um, so the real challenge in front of us is actually to use the good things we've gotten from capitalism, which is, you know, motivation, and actually not, you know, ma making the weakness something which is uh, like, um, you know, holy or sanctuary. I don't think weakness is such a sanctuary thing. I think we should uh, not uh, endorse weakness, but so, so it's about, finding out how to improve capitalism and, and make it uh, so that once I'm successful, it doesn't become ridiculously easier for me to continue to be successful. And I need to sort of uh, work hard constantly in order to find that, that, that new point, which is the new fair, which is the new dangerous, etc. Yeah. So, so, So one thing I kind of think about a little bit when I think about the history of technology to date and the history of trust and how they relate to each other, right? As you think about starting in a small community where you know your neighbors, you trust your neighbors, you're playing a long iterative game with them, right? So you have incentive not to screw your neighbor because they're still gonna be your neighbor tomorrow. You know, one of the brilliant things that's happened in the last, call it 100, 200 years, is we had a massive transportation revolution, right? Such that atoms moved around the world much more efficiently. And then we were forced to have a bits revolution, right? And the bits revolution were dollars, right? Was the ability to effectively then say, okay, I need to start transacting with people at a distance I don't know and I don't trust. How do I do that in a trusted way, right? And I think people forget and lose sight of the fact that currency, the dollar, et cetera, which you know, isn't as old as people like to think it is, right? Was a massive innovation for allowing trust at distance and allowing transaction at distance as kind of a capitalism 1.0 place. Right. Um, in some ways, now the bits have not only caught back up, 
but with a lot of modern internet technologies, now the bits move faster than atoms, right? Um, we live in this new world. You know, I think, do you agree first that compared to where we were 20 years ago, we're at a, in the United States, because I think it's not fair to talk globally, at a lower, a low point in social trust? No, it's a fact. Okay. It's, not, it's not about what so, I think, it's a fact. They've done research, we're at the lowest point in many, many decades. So then what, and you talk about, you've talked a lot about, you know, people talk about late capitalism, capitalism 2.0, and the role that crypto and, and blockchains have to play in that. Paint us a picture of what comes next. What is the, the there's a lot of cynical pictures, what's the non-cynical picture of the future where we get trust back? So values first. Okay. That's the short answer. And the longest answer is, the longer answer is basically this. We are plagued with monopoly problem and market powers, and that's the biggest economical situation or, or problem that we have. Um, the reason, the main reason for that is that first comes the fact, and then the story is backwards. So we use logic backwards to justify basically what guides us inside time and the stories we tell later, which should make sense to anybody anytime, are not the same thing. And I, I hear a lot about how uh, basically playing a rational game is self-defeating in, in, you know, in, in an economy and whether these incentive schemes that we're building are in fact gonna, people are gonna follow the incentive and behave better or is it an intrinsic property of people to be uh, essentially poking trust and looking for holes in trust, etc. And, and so what I envision is a place where you can get together with other people based on your shared values. Why, why is that important? This is important because even in Space Mesh, I took money from investors based on a certain technology but then I had to find myself making a lot of other decisions which has got nothing to do with what the investors expect from me and what I've sold the investors and nothing to do with the technology. And, and they are about re-evaluating some old kind of value in the modern... So in my mind, the values are constant. Everything else changes all the time. And you have to constantly move just to stay in one place, just to stay authentic to those values and... and so, so when you think about values, and I want to handle this because it's interesting, you know, capitalism and certainly the dollar is kind of a reductionist, compressed form of communication. I don't know everything about you, you don't know everything about me, we don't need to, we can still transact because a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And that has great properties, right? It allows lots of things to grow really efficiently. But because it's reductionist, because it doesn't have these other values baked into it, right? Um, there is something gained and something lost. You know, weaknesses are strengths and strengths are weaknesses. When you think forward to blockchain technologies broadly, to space mesh, to things like that, and you say, all of a sudden, we can transmit and store and remember in a guaranteed distributed way more than just the bits of a dollar, but in theory, the context around it. Yeah. Do you think that there is value, and this is very abstract, to thinking about encoding values and more into the blockchain? Is, do you think that's an important piece of what capitalism 2.0, if you want to call it that, looks like? Absolutely. Okay. I think that's most of what this is about. But there needs to be three sort of uh, boxes that we need to talk about with uh, how can we ever achieve this idea of coding uh, values. And essentially, if I want to tie my future to some other people and we want to create value together, what can this be based on? It can never be based on we both want to save global warming, okay? Because the targets that we will pursue will move all the time. It's got to be about something deeper than that which connects us and which uh, sort of allows us to be bigger than the sums of our parts. And if you ask me what I realized, I mean, I'm, I'm taking a caveat with your permission. I think, you know, my life has been uh, fortunate to me enough so I could take the last two years to really read and understand what's not working and why are we so, you know, chasing our own tails, unable to move forward. And, and 
I feel that I have a very different answer about this question than what I had two years ago when I just got into this. I think that, I thought that, well, yeah, everybody knows everything and then they decide stuff because they're benevolent or not. And now I realize that it's entirely not about their benevolence. And basically it's like driving a plane. If you don't know what's going on outside, you will hit the floor for sure. So if, you're, if your gauges don't give you an accurate picture of reality, you're doomed. And another situation that you're doomed is if you move the joystick to turn left, but the plane doesn't turn left, then you're also doomed. So I think our situation right now is that we don't have clear understanding of what's going on outside. And our policies, which is our joystick, don't really work in driving the plane in the right direction. And the, you know, the index is stuck on zero. So obviously, it's like the height meter of an airplane is stuck on zero, okay? It's kind of hard to fly the plane right now when you don't know what height you are. And so, so how are we going to get back to that? Because I think another thing, and I, I'll just paint some pictures that I think about is, um, you know, we've kind of, in my mind, the last 200 years, we've gotten very lazy with truth, right? And the reason we've gotten lazy is because of recorded media, right? If you think of 500 years ago, there was no recorded media, right? So you kind of had to construct truth through your social relationships, right? And it was constructed. And what ended up happening the last 200 years is recorded media, you know, audio, it was easy, it was easy to generate but hard to fake, right? Which means we got very lazy as a society yeah. and globe about just using these records as some sort of sense of shared truth and reality and trust. Mm -hmm. That's going away, right? I think we all know that's going away because it's becoming just as easy to fake as it is to create. Right, and right. so the question is, right. you know, what role, again, does blockchain, does this technology, does the kind of dream of where we're going play in your yeah, mind so, in reestablishing so that? I, I wanted to say that there's three points to this. So one thing which is super critical, as we said, is basically the idea of permissionless decentralization. The, the purest form of permissionless decentralization is this bottom-up feeding that we're missing so much in order to improve against something which is outside of us. And, and this feeding, this pure, the pureness of the feeding is really critical. Why? Just because what I've explained. So basically, you can see what happened and then render a story backwards. And then, essentially, you're imposing the, what happened as the inevitable truth. Right? And there's a story that capitalism is, you shouldn't touch it because if you do anything to capitalism, you slow it down. And, and if you want to get maximum result, you need to just lay off and let it fly, right? But, but I think now that this uh, approach we understand is wrong. I think that essentially, if we had a way to document truth in a way that is unfortunable or whatnot, we could have essentially deal, dealt with the right question, which is what to do next, and, and understanding the past allows you to... So, in my uh, humble opinion, and I might get some heat for saying that, uh, we didn't, as an industry, yet deliver on this very uh, initial promise. Right now, I cannot mine Bitcoin from home, I definitely cannot get into some proof of stake action as a 16 year old from home. And until we find another way to uh, get the, those who don't have a KYC and don't have a credit card and just have a PC at home, but they want to also, their voice matters and they want to be heard. So essentially, I, I truly believe that achieving permissionless decentralization is the very first step and we cannot make any compromises on that because the temptation, rather than learning from reality and then to basically forge the results of reality as if they justify our action, will always be there. And that, that will always... Uh, so, so, you know, so I, I made just, my life just, calling. To so just to, to push you on this, and again, it's an interesting game I like to play, which is forget all the technology. Right, throw it all out, right? Let's just talk about how we as human beings operate and then what the model is that we're really talking about with permissionless decentralization. Yeah, sweet, I love So this. there are eight billion people on Earth. I have a brain, you have a brain. We have sensors, right? We have the ability to communicate. 
I have a partial index, you have a partial index. Oh, yeah. They're overlapping but not in sync. They're all a little bit fractured. In your mind, in the ideal world that we're going to need for a hyper-connected future, where rather than saying, I can only speak to the people in the room, or I can speak just to you using the physical world, all of a sudden we have a new superpower, which is we can all talk to each other instantly for free. Right? That's a new line, crazy line of communication. Right. What is the biological, if you forget the computer side of it, evolution we need to make in terms of this idea of permissionless decentralization and trust to survive in that type of a world? So basically, culture matters a lot. And when I say culture, I mean that you have a surface between people. I don't know, you and I, when we get together, we have this thing, the way we like to talk. And some other people, whenever I get to, I meet them, so it talks about. So basically, you have this surface. It's a non-existing kind of transparent surface. And groups also have this surface. And again, when you go back to this most ancient and critical problem of what makes some groups so much more than the sum of their parts and what make other less, and, and you, you sort of really learn that, you find out that culture, in the sense that... And culture to you is shared norms. It, I, what is the, is it, is it fully encodable? Is it partially encodable? How it, do you... is, it is absolutely something that you do, and it is never something that you are. All of us, right now, can improve on our cultures, and basically, it's about saying, yo, it's all really comfortable, and engaging, and I care about what everybody has to say. And basically, what we don't understand intuitively, we look for leaders that do leading like actions, right? We don't look for leaders that are creating the atmosphere for something to naturally. We look for those symbols, those, those. So, yeah, that's, so essentially what I'm saying is that for people, to uh, perform better as a group, the smaller inside group things matter way more than we think. And that's because the future is very unpredictable. And every time that something unpredictable happens, we need to adjust. So there's this coherence that we need to constantly shape. And that, that, that coherence is, I think, the, the whole next maybe century will be about the benefits of this emerging coherence. So, so, so let me push you, though, because I think like, one thing I think about, you can talk about coherence, you can talk about going beyond you know, a lot of things you just kind of, without rehashing them, just went through. One thing I worry a lot about is that one of the key properties that's great about capitalism, as it currently stands, low information, you know, dollars only, et cetera, obviously a little bit of an exaggeration, but is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. Like, gone are the days where culture defined who you interacted with. Gone are the days when some people were allowed into some spaces, right. not all. All dollars are equally green. Right. Do you worry about a future, right, with, um, you know, what we can talk about, culture-oriented, next generation decentralization, identity, these things built together, cult more culture encoding, that you end up losing that, uh, that freedom and that equality? On the contrary. On the contrary, I think that we're, I, I'm, I'm, I have never been more excited in my life. So to your question whether I'm worried, if there is an opposite of worried, that's what I'm feeling. <laughs> I am extremely optimistic about the future of mankind. I think, um, the, the problem with capitalism 1.0 is not that people are bad, is something else, is that our instincts are essentially misleading us. Yeah. Our measurement and, isn't complete, our and, understanding isn't complete, and, and therefore to, it's hard. To the point you're trying to make, I think that a lot of the instrument, financial instruments, and I, I, this touches the point, the point that Olaf said yesterday, that we can, we can get better measurements of value less abstracted, much more anchored in real life. So, again, it's not like we as a company create a whole bunch of value. The, the default event is that, you know, the few uh, shareholders get all the value, and now as a retrospect process, we're kind of giving back away some of this value to our employees or whatnot. So, no, 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 no. The value, while created, is being divided, so there is no, like, after-the-fact kind of division and so on and so on. And this is like... That was the gold standard 
back in the days where gold was representing something real, a unit of measurement, and now as we evolve into the digital money, the, you know, what was proof of work to begin with was that, was exactly proof of time or something that allows to reduce the amount of abstraction, and I think what people tend to consider as uh, irrational or weird or strange behavior is actually very rational, but rational to the person who's behaving like that according to his beliefs, according to his stories, and according to his... So when we try to... Uh, when we stop to envision there's one picture that we can look from that one point on everything and see everything and understand everything and then judge people as logical and not logical based on that point, we should basically let go of that notion and understand that people think about life and about their decisions inside time in a very different way. So you stack right. yeah. layers of constraint one upon each other and then you have some picture of objective reality which is tons of constraints by tons of people all stacked together. So let me ask you, I mean, you, you kind of talked about your project Space Mesh and where you guys are, you, which I've always loved this line. You said it's, it's more Bitcoin than Bitcoin. Right, and you've kind of contrasted that to the DeFi world, which we were, you know, hearing uh, Meltem and Jill talk a little bit about, kind of the, the slide into we're all bankers again. Talk to me a little bit about what is, in your mind, more Bitcoin than Bitcoin, and is there ever anything that could be more space mesh than space mesh? <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I, I think anarchy and 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 you know, challenging the status quo has got a bad rap, but not rightfully so. So essentially, the way to evolve is to challenge the status quo all the time, and the way to uh, oppress is actually to, shh, to, to conform immediately with the consensus because that's... So there's always mistakes, and if you see yourself and your role, as somebody who seeks improvement constantly, then you would look for those places where you can improve. And then um, the reason that I need to be more Bitcoin than Bitcoin, essentially, is for the purity of this bottom-up feeding to that emerge. everyone can participate. And everyone can participate. It's entirely permissionless and entirely decentralized. So that's, again, the very basic idea here is that anybody can join via mining and you cannot stop it. And... Everybody, that's their into the game. They don't need to speculate. They take, it's riskless for them to get into the game. And, and this changes everything. It changes the dynamic. It changes how we will, rather than aim to manipulate and to game the system, we will aim to sh create value in a more shared way. So let me ask you, I mean, this is, I, guess, I think we have time for one last question. I'm kind of curious. I've never asked you this before. But if, you, if I forced you to say, what is more space mesh than space mesh? Like, if you had to go one click further, what, what would make, what would be an even more, I don't know, what vector would you drive further? You can tell I did not prep him on this question. Well, again, <laughs> I, I, think, I think about it on the base layer than being entirely permissionless and entirely decentralized. I think that's the end result of the base layer. Now on top of that, in the second layer, you can build many things, but I think the ultimate goal of DeFi, again, and, and I'm not, is that I get rich instead of you or something. It's a little bit feels to me like games of rich people. And, and the true calling, the bigger kind of, you know, game, game that could have been played here is essentially there's close for-profit system. They are true to their game. There is people's coin. And the people coin is true to its game, and the, it's, it creates a balance of power mm -hmm. between the corporation and the people, so not anything that has profit will happen. Yeah. So eventually, I seek to use this technology to slow us down. To, we just do too much. Maybe good things, maybe bad things, but too much things. And, and I don't think our planet and everything and mankind and our trust can survive this rate of, of, you know, accelerating anywhere, everywhere, all at the same time. So the voice of we the people can say something like, we get you, we understand there's profit in, in shelter bombs and profit in all those, like, but we don't want all that. Yeah, that's great. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Um, we'll take it from there.